What is up and welcome to the Bruin Bible, a very special edition today. Gentlemen, we have been pounding our fists on the table for months, for maybe even years, that Jerry Azanero, his time had run out. And today was finally that day. Azanero resigning as the defensive coordinator. I'm joined, as always, by the main man, the founder of LAFB, legend, Mr. Ryan Dyrud. What is going on, my man? What's up, Will? It's a good day in Westwood. You know I, I want to rephrase that because you never want to see someone lose their job. But I think in terms of just football capabilities, I think this is better for the future of UCLA. So happy to be here to talk about this, this big breaking news that just came down. Wearing an awesome Demetric Felton shirt too, which I love to see our boy Felton balling out on Sunday. Part, part of the LAFB connection right there. The legend himself uh, doing big things for the Browns. Hopefully we can get him on a podcast moving forward. And then we have the mad dog in the house phenomenal dude all around he's a ucla fan even though he went to usc we got mad love for jamal what's going on brother will the thrill big day big day is right and as an arrow resignation happens while i believe ucla would be reworking chip kelly's contract just to kind of give you some insight on how bad as an arrow's tenure was as the ucla defensive coordinator the defense is ranked 104th, 116th, 73rd, and 79th in scoring defense over the last four years. And the past defense ranked in the hundreds all but one year, and that was 2020, a shortened season. <laughs> it has been time to get this guy out at UCLA. I'm going to start with you, Ryan. How big of a development is this for the future of UCLA football moving forward? Well, I think it's huge because it, it – Two things. One, A, I think now we can just have better product on the field defensively. Um, you know, as an arrow, if we if we want to talk, you know, both sides of it, does do some good things in his system. You know, he plays a very aggressive style. Um, you know, we were beginning of the season. It seemed like the defense had kind of shifted in that LSU game. And it was like, oh, here's kind of what this fun as an arrow defense looks like with guys flying over the field. Quentin Lake, Quantrez Knight getting after the quarterback and and then it just, but it just gives up too many explosive plays. It's not refined enough. Uh, it didn't seem like players were disciplined enough. Uh, and, and that just kind of falls on him. And that was the, the stain on his tenure and kind of his coaching legacy as a whole, unfortunately, because even when he was with Philadelphia with Chip. Um, so I think, A, you, you'll, we'll see an improvement now. No matter who they bring in, we'll see something better than what we've seen. I mean, it's hard to get much worse than what they were. But two, I think it shows that, this was a, I don't know if it's from specifically, you know, the AD himself or what, but the fact that Chip Kelly was able to split ties, because yes, as an era resigned, but I'm sure it was more of a, <laughs> hey, we're going to move on so you can resign and make it look better or we're going to have to fire you. Um, I don't think he just decided I'm going to hang it up and, and move on on January 12th or whatever today is. So um, I think it just shows that there is some control among this program that they do notice that. We did good things on offense. We weren't good enough on defense. We think Chip is a good long-term answer, but we can't have that pairing anymore. We need to move on. So I think it just shows as a as a whole the program moving forward in the right direction. You can't you can't get fired if you quit first, as I like to say. And this guy quit before he could get the axe. I do believe this was a real stipulation that UCLA put forth. They're going, hey, Chip, we believe you could potentially be the guy. We're trying to rework that contract now but you cannot bring back as an arrow. And I think chip relayed that information to as an arrow as an arrow, not met, wanting to make a scene, you know, stepped aside accordingly. Jamal, give me the same thing. How big is this for UCLA? Because the implications are massive. If we get a defense in there for this chip Kelly offense, I'm scared to see what that future looks like. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, when you look at UCLA in terms of total offense in the PAC 12 scoring offense in the PAC 12, it's a top two offense. Uh, when you look at them defensively, they're in the bottom quartile of the Pac-12. And so, you know, when you sort of add those two ingredients up, you still got to an eight and four season. So even if you can kind of move up the defense, even to fourth or fifth in the Pac-12, you're really talking about legitimately competing for the South, for the overall conference and being in the mix for a New Year's Six Bowl. And so this is really significant. And Ryan, I want to kind of double click on your points because I think they were really profound. I think the timing of this is very interesting 
right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it falls right in between the, the January 15th cloud of when Chip Kelly's buyout goes to zero and on the front end, you know, what folks in the NFL industry call Black Monday, which is sort of the Monday after the, the last day of the regular season and when NFL coaches usually get the ax. And I think the, the product of that is that on both sides of the equation, I think from a UCLA perspective, I think the folks that got fired from the NFL weren't really fits or candidates or possibilities to be eligible for the UCLA job. And on the other side, I think Chip is looking at the market also after everyone got fired and said, hey, I don't know if there's necessarily a fit in the NFL for me as an offensive coordinator. And where else am I going to get four and a half million dollars next year as a coordinator in the NFL? And so even if I have to come back to UCLA without a lucrative buyout or without much with in terms of an extension, I need to sort of make this work. And now my ties to Azanero, I just don't have the leverage to be able to demand those things from UCLA in the same way that I did a couple of weeks ago and certainly a couple of years ago. And this defense had a ton of talent, you know, a lot of, you know, veteran secondary players and, you know, up front, you look at the rushing numbers and how much we allowed per game. I think it was very much slanted because we were getting a lot of sacks, which count against the run game. Uh, the run defense was fine. That was never a problem with as an arrow, at least the last couple of years, but just the past defense, it was consistently bad over and over again. And you look at some of these players in the secondary and, you know, Jamal and I are going to be talking about Quantrez Knight in the upcoming draft episode. Quantrez Knight is a specialist. This guy is not playing coverage. He is blitzing off the outside edge. Mm -hmm. He kind of does what your Jamal Adams does in the NFL where he's using the run game. He's doing some other stuff, but if you want to put him in as a pass coverage safety, he's not going to be much help back there. That's just kind of the way he goes. And that's kind of the future he has in the NFL. The only re really reliable guy back there was Quentin Lake as the safety and he played a combined nine games in 2019, 2020. So he just wasn't valuable back there that the Cameron Johnson's, the Steven Blaylock's just never kind of ascended to the level of a veteran starting PAC 12 corner that we would have liked to have seen. Granted, a lot of those were difficult situations as you're sending a large amount of the men back there to blitz the quarterback to get in the backfield. So it's a lot of one-on-one -on -one situations, mm -hmm. a lot of pressure on the corner to make that play, but it just never really worked. And now we're talking about a future where we do not have as an arrow. Um, Will, the one thing I, I just sort of add to that is in terms of the timing of this, and you talked about schematically where the defense took a lot of chances, they gambled, they were undisciplined. You know, you go back to that Oregon game where they had back to back to back offsides where they literally let Oregon into the end zone. And when you look at that being only a three point game at the end, I mean, just critical mistakes that could have changed the trajectory of the season. But when you also look roster wise, that seven starters are going to need to be replaced, at least seven starters. This yeah. is the right opportunity now to bring in a defensive coordinator with different schematic principles, different sort of visions of discipline, a different thought process in terms of culture and mentality on the defensive side of the ball, because this is that opportunity to really take new, fresh talent and mold them into the system that you want and really in that prime developmental phase. And so if you came back with Oz with a brand new roster on defense, now you're just reinforcing these bad habits and it becomes this domino effect that you have to sort of pay for, not just next season, but in the seasons to come. And that's why this is so significant. Yeah, and I do want to preach patience with whatever defensive coordinator we do end up hiring. Like you said, seven guys expected to be gone. Detona Jackson, Jen Markeith, Quantrez Knight, who we just mentioned, Obi Ibo, Johnson, Otio Ogbonia, you know, Quentin Lake, all guys that were, you know, reliable starters for this defense for the most part going to be gone. There's going to be a lot of turnover on the defensive side of the ball. So whoever we're going to be hiring on that uh, on defense, let's let's preach some patience. 2023 is the target year that we want to see results on that side of the ball. I do want to say this. Uh, Bruin report just came out. Clancy Pendergrass, who was a former USC defensive coordinator, um, not expected to be in the mix. He was an analyst for UCLA uh, this past year, so will not be in the running, uh, believed, for the defensive coordinator job. 
But I do want to bring up a name that we have long talked about. Ryan was actually the first person that mentioned this to me in the Rose Bowl parking lot before the USC-UCLA game. And that guy's Jimmy Lake, a guy that has proven track record experience on developing very solid defenses at Washington. He was the secondary coach there. We've had secondary issues. What better guy to get in there to develop some top-level talent for UCLA than Jimmy Lake? Jamal, how big of a deal would it be if Jimmy Lake potentially came to UCLA? Well, I think it would be really significant. He's a tremendous defensive mind uh, and coach, was the defensive coordinator at Washington in their kind of really mini run of owning the Pac-12 year recently between 2016 and 2018. You know, people forget Washington went all the way to the playoff uh, in, yeah. in 2016. And it's not like they had blue chip guys all over the place offensively at the skill positions or even at the offensive line. That was really driven by kind of a pass controlled offense and physicality of defense. And Jimmy Lake had a lot to do with them going to the playoffs. Jimmy Lake had a lot to do with in 2018, Washington making it all the way to the Rose Bowl against Ohio State. I think his familiarity with the Pac-12, his overall ability uh, to sort of set up defenses, I think, and, you know, his style defensively, I think works really well potentially for UCLA. The one, I don't want to call it concern, but the one red flag that you have to sort of acknowledge is that he did get into a little bit of sort of a physical altercation with a player. And yeah. so when you're talking about kind of ethics review and, and kind of behavioral review at a place like UCLA that is so values driven, I think there's going to need to be a conversation there. Uh, but outside of that, I think he is, uh, really a great name. I've got two others, Will, but I'll, I'll pause there and, and let Ryan speak to Jimmy Lake. Yeah, right. Tell me what you think about Jimmy Lake, because are you just as high as him as you were in that uh, USC parking lot when we were speaking initially? Yeah, I, I mean, it's football wise. I mean, this would be a slam dunk. I mean, when he joined the Washington staff with Chris Peterson, uh, I believe they're his first season, they were 41st in the country and then moved 13th, 8th, fifth and fifth in the country in defensive uh, prowess and statistics, which is just incredible improvement. Uh, he has, you know, obviously recruiting prowess as well. So he could basically be the recruiter that Chip Kelly is not uh, and focus on basically recruiting and the defense, which would be huge for this team, for this program. You look at development of players as they move on to the next round, which is so big nowadays in recruiting, because I talked on my show last night, how I would argue that nowadays 98% of players really don't care that much about winning a national championship because they know it runs through about four teams. So if they're not playing for Alabama or Clemson or Georgia or Ohio State, they're basically improving to get to the NFL level. And a coach like Jimmy Lake, you look at the prowess he had, I keep using that word, but it's so fitting because look at some of these names that he developed at Washington and now are thriving in the NFL. I mean, Danny Shelton, Marcus Peters, Kevin King, Buda Baker, Vita Vey, Sidney Jones, Byron Murphy, Taylor Rapp, right here in Los Angeles with the Rams. Oh, I mean, geez. that alone, when guys are trying to come to Westwood and they're thinking, well, USC, Lincoln Riley, well, well I, I don't know. Defensively, UCLA is a better program. They have Jimmy Lake. Look at all the guys at the NFL level. It would just be, I think, a slam dunk hire. If the ethically, looking at it, Jamal, like you mentioned, if that all checks out and it was just a one-time heated exchange moment, um, then I think this is like the go-to. I agree. And Jarman is going to have to look him in the eyes and try to make that assumption if he is serious about, you know, potentially hiring him. And we may have gotten some, you know, preconceived notions that he might be thinking about him. You know, Washington's Okeka Malo, the new linebackers coach, worked under Jimmy Lake. Huh? So that could potentially be a guy that, you know, adds to the staff and familiar with Jimmy Lake's defensive tendencies, which I'm really stoked about there. Um, I just think there's a lot of positive opportunities. And I think you made a phenomenal point. Ryan, where for now, I think if you're a quarterback in Southern California, I'm just a realist. Lincoln Riley being at USC, seeing the NFL quarterbacks he's put out, that's going to be the place they're going to want to go, right? If you're a quarterback, that's going to be option number one if you're talented there. But if you're a running back, if you're in the offense, Chip Kelly, that's a very enticing offense too. I mean, it's not even too far behind USC. But if you can add that defensive element where it's like, this is the place to go defensively if you're talented within the L.A. area. That is such a recruiting advantage. And the two biggest holes in the Chip Kelly era, I think, for most fans, recruiting and defense. If you can 
Get those two swallowed up. I think this chance, this team has a chance to win nine, 10 games easy year in and year out with a Chip Kelly and a Jimmy Lake. Jamal, I did not forget that you have two potential coordinator names that I'm really excited to hear. Hit me with them, man. I'm, I'm interested. Yeah, so obviously, you know, Lake would be a home run. I'm going to throw in a, two other names that I think need to be considered as possible home runs as well. One, Justin Wilcox, head coach oh. of Cal. I think that when you look at his track record, he was a defensive coordinator of those great Boise State teams from 2006 to 2009. He was defensive coordinator at Washington, USC, Wisconsin. You look at his tenure with Cal as a head coach right now, four years in, 26 and 28. He's floundering as a head coach, and he's a little bit frustrated with how Cal has sort of handled COVID-related policies and issues. I think there seems to kind of be an inevitability with his career that it's probably not going to end well in a season or two at Cal. Why not jumpstart your career, be proactive, and become the defensive coordinator of UCLA? Again, with that familiarity with the Pac-12 and USC in particular, that could be a real match made in heaven because at his ethos, he's a defensive guy. The, the other name Jamal, that I- real quick. To, I, don't, I don't want to cut your legs out from under you. Just curious your thoughts on this because we talked about it in a previous episode. Because I, yeah. I mean, that would be a a even more slam dunk almost. Like I would love that. But what what are your thoughts on the fact that there were reports that he turned down Oregon to stay at Cal, but then would would basically take a demotion to DC? Do you see that as a possibility? Or you're kind of just throwing a name out there that hey, why not make the phone? Fair call? question, Ryan. I'm not sure. I think he's a, I think he's a very astute, intelligent individual. And I'm not sure that the Oregon situation, A, how much truth there was to him actually turning it down, Mm -hmm. and B, how much of a fit uh, there would have been at Oregon. I think the rationale for him being so high on Oregon's list was just because he was an Oregon man. And I think that so much of that uh, booster base kind of wanted to get back to just you know, guys that understood Oregon and went to Oregon and so forth. And I think he kind of saw that as, hey, do you want me for my track record and what I can do? Or do you just want me because I went to Oregon? Because if it's the latter, this is not going to end well in the next two seasons. And I think he's an intelligent enough individual to sort of recognize that fit is important. I also don't think that Cal is a destination job for him. And so I think at some point he's going to have to make a decision because I, I do see him in two years being in a position where Cal's going to have to make a change because that's a tough job. Mm-hmm. And I think that he is such a bright young coordinator that I think he has an opportunity to jumpstart, jumpstart his stock um, at, at, a, at another place. And why not that be a Pac-12 school? Yeah, cool. Just I, love the, I love the answer for Wilcox. And one thing that I've really been impressed with from him from a defensive side of the ball standpoint is if you look at the Pac-12 total defense numbers, Cal is usually near the top of that list, if not in major number one in major categories. And he's done that without, you know, Jeff Tedford was able to get some elite recruits in there. You know, your Deshaun Jacksons, your Marshawn Lynch's players like that. But with, with this team, it's mostly two and three star guys. You might have an occasional four star. He's building that defense up without the talent of, you say, your USC's, your maybe even Arizona State's, your Utah's, things like that. So Wilcox building that up with little to no, you know, stars in recruiting is very impressive to me. Who's your number two option? The I, and I, I don't want to call this a number two option because I like this individual just as much, if not more potentially in some aspects uh, then the other two names that we mentioned, and that is Gary Patterson, former coach of mm. TCU. Yeah. And when you look at Gary Patterson's, what he has built at TCU over 20 years, primarily being on the defensive side of the ball in terms of his specialty, 181 and 79 in 20 plus years at TCU, six top 10 finishes. He had the Rose Bowl win with Andy Dalton. He won the Peach Bowl a couple of years ago. And when you talk about familiarity with Lincoln Riley, who knows Lincoln Riley better than Gary Patterson when Lincoln Riley was at OU and Gary Patterson was at TCU. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about, you know, Will, you brought up kind of the the Lincoln Riley USC situation. I know you're a little bit of a basketball guy, so I'm going to take a 20-second basketball analogy. You know, SC now over the next three years 
you know, the concentration of talent, it's sort of their conference right now. Everyone has to sort of yeah. match up with USC, much in the same way Daryl Morey had to match up the Houston Rockets to what the Golden State Warriors were, much in the same way Larry Bird had to match up the Indiana Pacers to what those great Miami Heat, the Heatles teams were. You sort of have to think now about how do you match up with USC. And when you look at Lincoln Riley's track record, obviously he's won a lot. But the games that he has lost, and lost convincingly, he has lost to physical defenses with a front four pass rush that knows how to blitz. He's lost to Venables. He's lost to Saban. He's lost to Smart. He's lost to Oklahoma State. He's lost to Dave Aranda. And so when you look at the type schematically of what Gary Patterson built at TCU, strong pass rushes that have a blitzing brand of ball, what better counter move if you are UCLA than to infuse Gary Patterson in there? And then the second thing that you get is you get a guy with deep head coaching experience who's respected in the industry. And he, if things don't work out with Chip for whatever reason, if that Jarman Chip relationship gets a little bit wobbly, you've got a coach in waiting now in Gary mm-hmm. Patterson that can take over the head reins and really not miss a beat. And so, you know, Gary Patterson reportedly was in Austin. He's looking at potentially being kind of an advisor to Steve Starkeesian mm. at Texas. So he's open to sort of the possibility of kind of getting back into the into the coaching game without necessarily needing to be the head coach. That's a call Jarman's got to make. If we oh, can yeah. get him out of Texas and into Southern California, that is a win. Like you said, tons of experience, great winning record as a head coach. And you just want to combine as much – Uh, talented and intelligent football minds into one room. That is what the coaching staff is all about. Patterson definitely fits the description on that. Ryan, what would you think about Gary Patterson potentially coming to UCLA? I I mean, I love all three of those names, all three head coaching experience, uh, Gary Patterson. I I don't think it gets talked about enough what he did at TCU. It's not like uh, some blue blood football program uh, that, you know, just is supposed to be good. Like he created a culture there was there for a long time and they had some really, really good winning seasons. Um, and then, you know, obviously the end of the tenure wasn't as great, but also produced some great NFL prospects on both sides of the ball. Um, and so having that experience, and I think it helps too, maybe bringing someone in that has experience outside of the conference. I think that is what USC looked at when they brought in Lincoln Riley, you have someone now that's been at other parts of the country, Obviously, he's done great already recruiting, you know, at modern day in Southern California, but he still has pipelines elsewhere. Gary Patterson opens that pipeline to Texas where UCLA can now recruit kids from Texas as well as Southern California, which I think would be great on that side of the ball. So I think that would be a huge slam dunk too. you know, easier than uh, Wilcox, him and Lake both obviously being unemployed right now. Um, Obviously, the report of him, you know, down at Texas makes it a little bit more difficult because there is competition there. Um, but he would have a bigger role being a DC as opposed to an analyst or, or a mentor kind of thing. So, uh, the biggest question for me though, if he comes is who has the better visor game, Chip Kelly or Gary Patterson, (laughs) that's what it comes down to. That is a question that will be very hard to determine on those sides. They even look similar. I know. Yeah, they, they do look similar now that I think about it. With the visor, like if Chip, face shape. If Chip gets sick of the media, he could probably just escape away and say, all right, Gary, you're playing my role for this uh, this uh, session. Yeah, we'll be looking down the second quarter realizing it's not really Chip Kelly calling the yeah, plays. It's like, Gary Patterson it? this entire time. Whoever we get a defensive coordinator, it's going to be hopefully a lot better. 431.9 yards allowed in four years for Azanero. That is the worst in the history of UCLA football. So we are out of the smoke with that. I want to talk about DTR's return. This was expected on the last podcast. A lot has happened with, you know, the Dylan Gabriel potential transfer. Um, we should also note that Caleb Williams is visiting UCLA this week. I thought we may be out of it. You know, he was in LA. It was rumored, you know, potentially with Jackson Dart's transfer that he was kind of going in there. But the fact we are getting a visit with Caleb Williams is massive. Give me your thoughts first on DTR, and then I just want to hear, percentage-wise, how high do you think we can potentially get to see if Caleb Williams can becomes a Bruin? I'm starting with you, Ryan. DTR, then Caleb Williams. Yeah, it's you know it's it's hard to separate the two because DTR announces coming back. Like, okay, there it is. That's what the next season is going to look like. DTR year five. We'll see the progression there. And then it comes out that, well, Caleb Williams is still meeting with UCLA. So um, what does that mean for DTR? So first though, 
let's just quickly talk about DTR. You know, I great for him. I think uh, we talked about it last episode. I've talked about it on my show. Uh, obviously, put feelers out there for the NFL. Probably didn't get the greatest response. It was probably looked at more as a a walk on, a maybe flyer seventh round pick. And so Tyler for him, it made Hunter all the se- yeah. And so him, it made all the sense to come back another year, a fifth year. Show that this year was more of what he is. Because I said before too that it's sad, it's unfair, but his legacy is so tarnished from those first two years. People forget how much he has imp- improved the last two years. I mean, he was probably the second best quarterback in the Pac-12 last season, yeah. um, just behind Cameron Rising. So, you know, he cut the turnovers down exponentially. T- uh, touchdowns were up. Decision-making was better. Used his legs a lot more. So we actually saw his athletic gifts a lot more last season. And if he can expound and improve on that even more, not only does that mean UCLA's offense is just going to be that much better than they already were. You know, you go from an eight-win team to potentially a nine- or ten-win team plus all the defensive stuff maybe <laughs> helps improve that a lot. But then he he becomes maybe a mid-round draft pick or even higher if he if he just blows up this year. I mean, we talked, too, about guys that come back for their fifth year. And, Will, you said it best. In nowhere are we comparing him to Joe Burrow. But look at Joe Burrow's fourth season compared to his fifth season. Like, insane what value he gained. And DTR, I think, is looking at that and having that hopeful potential to do that. Now, with Caleb Williams coming, though, I mean, if he gets – this actual visit is real and chip Kelly goes to Caleb Williams and says, Hey, if you come here, you're my guy. Cause nowadays that's how recruiting is. It used to be, Hey, we wanted you to compete, come here. Here's our brand. Here's what we do. Here's our culture. Nowadays you basically have to promise a starting role to these kids. Yeah. That's just the way it is now. So chip in order for Caleb to even really think about it, he's going to have to go to him and say, Hey, I know DTR said he's coming back. I love DTR. Love he's dumb, but you are the guy. If you, commit to UCLA you are the face of UCLA for the next two to three years however long you want to stay you're my starter which they mean DTR obviously is probably going to transfer so it's a huge interesting dichotomy um Caleb Williams I think you see at USC is still the favorite but I do think UCLA is actually in the running I truly do Jamal said it really really well and he'll probably get into it too about Caleb Williams and his father talking about what's best for his future not necessarily winning a conference or winning a title but for the NFL development and I think UCLA can really aid in that, maybe even more so than USC, which is crazy to get into. But I'll let Jamal get into that too. So a lot of crazy stuff. I mean, it's insane. I think it's great that we're just be able to talk about UCLA football on January 12th, which usually we're not. So uh, at least we're in the news and, and we're in the talks. And, uh, you know, it's good for the LA Football Network. And I'm glad, before I get to Jamal, I'm glad you brought up his run uh, efficiency last year. He was a guy that had the ability to kind of break the game, especially for defenses, if he was to run outside. He doubled his highest career rushing totals this past year for a singular season, getting to 619 yards and nine touchdowns. So DTR, yeah. if he can add that to the, you know, he cut down on his picks last year to six interceptions, one fumble loss. Like we're looking at a guy that, you know, is really taking those strides. But like we said, if Caleb Williams wants to come here, all bets are off. We yeah. got to make sure that Caleb comes. I love DTR. Would be happy to have him back. But if Williams wants to come, I will gladly drive DTR to the airport. Jamal, give me your take on DTR coming back and the potential of Caleb Williams. I think, you know, Ryan said it so well, Will. It, it makes all the sense in the world, right? Because it's all upside with very little downside. DTR got the feelers, realized, hey, I'm either going to be super late in this draft or most probably undrafted. Let me come back to UCLA, the place that I'm familiar with, where I've just had success, a lot of momentum. Let me put more consistency on tape. But again, with that opportunity of now I don't have Phillips. Now I don't have Dulcich. I probably won't have Charbonnet. I don't have Brown. I don't have my top two receivers. I don't have my top two rushers. And if I can create a strong performance in 2022 where I either maintain or potentially exceed statistically as well as from a win-loss perspective, my stock goes through the roof because those are the skills that NFL people salivate over of guys that regardless of what's around them, that's almost sort of interchangeable. It's because of their consistency, their decision-making, and their productivity, you're getting success. And so that makes all the sense in the world for me for DTR. Now, you know, in the seesaw game of, of the UCLA quarterback, Caleb Williams, I give it right now probably a 10% chance uh, that, that he un- ultimately picks UCLA. I think it's a puncher's chance, but obviously there's other players 
um, that are more the favorite from perception reasons. But what I will say is, you know, Caleb Williams' father is someone who's really driving the decision here from all indications, a very intelligent person with a lot of vision. And he wants Caleb to be best prepared for the NFL. This isn't about winning the Heisman. This isn't about winning national championships. This is about how well can Caleb be best prepared to have success at the professional level. And if you look at, and Will, you and I have talked about this, the last 10 years in the NFL, what's the one common denominator that the NFL MVPs have had the last 10 years at quarterback? Some obviously are great pocket passers. Some are great athletes, different systems, different geographies. But if you really go to that one thread of commonality, it's that they all went to non-traditional universities, non-traditional yes. programs, and took historically five, six win teams and turned them into nine, 10 win teams. Look at Mahomes. Look at Rodgers. Look at Lamar Jackson. Look at Cam. Look at Matt Ryan. None of those guys went to household names. And look at the success that they got because – they truly had to perform at the highest level because they did not have advantages at all the offensive positions. Where conversely, you look at the great USC teams, the Miami teams, the Florida teams, the Alabama teams, bust, 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 <laughs> because they had advantages at every position. And if Caleb is really thinking about what is going to be best for me NFL-wise, you know, SC is going to be littered with five-star talent here the next couple of years. Go to UCLA, build something, and that's the best pre preparation for the NFL. And I think that's the, the sales pitch to Caleb for UCLA. And I love that point, too, because I was making a similar point about Wilcox. The most impressive you know, coaches and quarterbacks, for that matter, are the ones that elevate the talent around them to get to heights that was not initially planned. So you have a Wilcox elevating that Cal defense to top ten. You have people like, you know, Mahomes getting that offense to top 10 in the country. Caleb Williams could do that for UCLA. And like we said in the previous podcast, Troy Aikman, let's get him on the phone. Let's get him showing him around the facilities, making sure we can reel him in. You mentioned we were losing some top-notch receiving talent, uh, but we did get another transfer to compliment Jake Bobo, the Duke wide receiver, 70-plus catches, a guy I'm really excited about. This guy I'm very excited about, and I did not know much about him at all uh, until I did some research yesterday. His name is Titus Mokiawa Atimalala. I hope Good I job. pronounced that correctly. Um, Four-star guy, caught 12 passes, 102 yards, and a touchdown. But when I looked at his 24-7 uh, profile, USC offer, Notre Dame offer, Michigan offer, and this guy played high school football in Hawaii. So that's a hard place for coaches to get out to and scout film. If he's getting offers from those schools, this guy can clearly play the game of football. To me, he looks like a bigger explosive uh, Kyle Phillips. He's six foot one, 175 pounds. Maybe he has a faster 40 time looking directly down the field. Chip's far from done in the transfer portal. Um, what I want to talk about, Jamal, give me your take on how successful Chip has been in the transfer portal because it has immediately gotten UCLA back into the game last year with guys like Charbonnet and Quantrez Knight from a couple of years before. If you can keep building this, this could be an eight to nine win team every single year at the very least. Yeah, well, no question about it. I mean, what the transfer portal has now done is it's created the ultimate secondary market of top talent that college football has ever had. And now no longer do you necessarily need to be as incessant about recruiting uh, right out of high school. And the reality is that once you even get a guy, you have to constantly be recruiting him to stay with you because we're sort of now in this world where any type of a situation goes wrong. You lose some playing time. You lose a starting spot. You get injured. Now I can just jump into the transfer portal and go see what the better situation is there for me. And so, you know, and sometimes I think why the transfer portal is so magical is, you know, you mentioned the receiver from Central Florida, four star. You know, he sounds like a guy, and, and I've, I've done some research on him as well, super talented, but a laid back kid, you know, from Hawaii, you know, going to a USC, going to a Notre Dame, going to some of these places are very intense environments about football, and you need to have that personality mesh as well. And so, you know, Central Florida, a little bit more of a laid back place, also with the beach. You know, you, you come to UCLA, a little bit more of a laid back football culture that probably meshes really well with him personality wise. And you start getting these gems 
where initially really hard to make the best decision for yourself right out of high school at 18 years old. Sometimes you need that year or two of life experience to go do a thing and realize, hey, this is really who I am as a person. This is what's really important to me athletically and socially. And the transfer portal allows you to do that. And when you have a university like UCLA that's so elite academically, that provides such amazing social opportunities, that's placed in Hollywood, it is always going to be a prime candidate for a transfer portal destination. Chip's done a phenomenal job of that, and I think will continue to do so. And that's why I think UCLA will continue to be a perennial contender if they put the hooks in the right way defensively. And Ryan, I mean, he is on track to become the new school era of Bill Snyder at Kansas State. Kansas State built their program with, you know, nothing really recruiting rise in Kansas, not a lot of talent out there. But this guy benefited from a lot of JUCO transfers and players from top-notch programs that maybe didn't mesh in as well as Jamal was just saying. Give me your take on how talented Chip has been in the recruiting portal because we always, you know, kind of harp on the fact that he doesn't really – is, is not totally invested in the whole recruiting process, but he is able to get really credible players from the transfer portal. And I think that's worth rewarding as a fan. Yeah. Well, you know, Chip Kelly has always, I think in his career, like him or love him, been considered kind of an innovator as a coach, yeah. whether it was offensively um, or different ways. And this is just another example of that, I mean, you mentioned Bill Snyder kind of did it first, but outside of that, there's not a, a known commodity that has essentially built his programs through the transfer portal. And Chip is now doing that and kind of getting a lot of recognition for it. Cause everyone talks about man, another, another transfer to UCLA. And I was talking with a buddy of mine a while back. If, if this is a, a sustainable model, and at some point, is he going to have to really buckle down and, and get these four-star and a couple five-star recruits? But I think it's not, it is sustainable now with the new rules and how the transfer portal works and essentially an era of free agency in college football yeah. and how quickly these guys move. I mean, Jackson Dart, Caleb Williams hasn't even committed to USC and Jackson Dart decided to enter the portal. So I think it is absolutely sustainable because chip realizes being as smart as he is and being the innovator that he is this is the way college football is going and i can just look at guys that other guys that all the work recruiting they get a year in at that program so they already get kind of groomed and get their bodies bigger and then just come for me and start right off the bat and we'll just go and win eight nine ten win games every single season hopefully so uh, i think it's great what he's doing i think it's uh he deserves a ton of credit for it and it's the model that i think works best for UCLA, especially with Lincoln Riley being here now, yeah. because you will never out recruit Lincoln Riley. So the way you beat him, or at least try to keep up with him is getting those sophomore and junior players that have already been recruited, have already built their bodies up and now can come and start day one and don't have to sit behind, you know, seniors and juniors for a year. Cause they'll come to UCLA and, and get playing time right off the bat. So it's, it's a perfect combative to play USC in Los Angeles for this market. So it's been phenomenal, I think, what he's doing. And and uh, you mentioned the young receiver. I think he's been a great fit. And I think losing a guy like Kyle Phillips is so hard to replace. Yeah. With Jake Bobo and now Titus Adamala, um, it's, it's at least, you know, they can have a chance to replace him. And I think they'll do a good job of it. And Ryan, he's the genius, okay, of the transfer portal that Chip doesn't get enough credit for. 80% of UCLA's class has to have a 3.0 high school GPA. Yeah. And when you are now a transfer student, now that requirement goes away because now you have wow. a college GPA. And so that now opens up the aperture of who you can actually get. Mm. There, that's a subtlety that I think a lot of fans don't realize is the genius in that is you're actually opening up access to guys that you wouldn't necessarily have access to even 12 months prior. And so flipping them is actually much easier than trying to get them the first go around. And again, doing this a different way than Riley and USC, I think is innovative. It's brilliant. And again, why Chip is the right guy for this job. We Great love point. it. Chip likely to come back. Monumental day, gentlemen, with Asnero going. We had to get the fellas back on the pod. This is how we win, guys. Replace the defensive coordinator, get in transfers, and hopefully get a transfer like the name of Caleb Williams. Bruin Bible, we're out. Thank you to Ryan and Jamal. Uh, just one last thing I want to say. It may not be every week we do the Bruin Bible in the offseason, but it will be consistent. So keep listening, keep following. We will do everything we can to report all the big-name news coming out of UCLA.